also like to thank the organizer for, uh, organizers for putting together this excellent workshop and for giving me the opportunity uh, to present uh, some of my uh, results on the strong cor correlation effects on the uh, Shiba states inside the superconducting gaps. So I will start with uh, the classical picture again, so sorry for that, so it's probably the fifth time that you hear about <laughs> it today. Uh, but for the rest of the talk I will focus on uh, quantum effects, in fact. Uh, so the, the simplest model to describe a quantum, uh, an impurity, a magnetic impurity inside a superconductor is starting with a simple BCS type Hamiltonian, which is a mean field quadratic Hamiltonian. And then to describe the impurity, uh, we take a quantum mechanical spin operator, uh, which I denote by uh, uppercase S, and it couples to a local spin density of the conductance bent electrons, uh, let's say at some point of the system. Now it turns out that this system is very difficult to solve, but what uh, if one wants to make some analytical progress, one indeed takes the classical limit, which consists of taking large S limit, but so that J times S is a constant. And what this does is that the uh, out of diagonal, so uh, transverse matrix elements of the uh, S spin operator decay as one over square root of S. So they go to zero in the large S limit, but as you can see already, S needs to be pretty large uh, for this to be small. But uh, if you do this mathematical exercise, what you find is that in the end, uh, your quantum impurity loses any local quantum dynamics and basically it's just a static uh, local magnetic field. So again, you end up with a quadratic Hamiltonian that you can diagonalize and you can use single particle picture. Right? And the way to do that formally uh, is through the Bogolyubo de Gen approach. So basically, you write your degrees of freedom by doubling them into the Nambu spinors. Uh, then you take this uh, extended um, Bogolyubo de Gen Hamiltonian, which has twice the usual size. And this implies immediately that uh, the resulting spectrum will actually have uh, what I call a particle hole redundancy. And I would like to emphasize that this is not the same thing as particle hole symmetry. So the system can very well be a particle hole asymmetric, but still you expect to find this particle hole redundancy. But this is simply a mathematical fact which comes out uh, from uh, the doubling of the degrees of freedom. Now to get rid of this redundancy, what you can do is just uh, speak about uh, excitations with respect to the ground state of the system. And in this case, you only, pick, uh, you only keep the positive energy states uh, so, because by definition, an excitation has larger energy than the ground state. Uh, but these operators are actually combinations, so superpositions of particle creation and particle annihilation operators. So, in fact, by this, uh, in this approach, you still describe the full spectrum of the system, both particle-like and whole-like excitations, so at positive and negative frequencies. Okay, and uh, if you finally do that uh, on your uh, classical model, what you find is that for very small uh, coupling to the impurity, basically what you will find is just the quasi-particle continuum starting at delta. And then you increase J, you will see that one of the states from the quasi-particle continuum will sort of, sort of detach from the continuum, continuum and become a bound state, as was described uh, in a more uh, intuitive picture this morning by Leonid Glasman. Uh, and uh, then uh, if you actually do the calculation, you see that uh, this state has a particular dependence. And the interesting thing here is that at some point, uh, the excitation energy goes to zero. And the interpretation for that is that uh, at this point, uh, the, a quasi-particle is actually statically bound on your impurity and you change the parity of your quantum state. So not the charge, because uh, charge is not a well-defined quantum number, but the parity definitely changes, as well as the spin. Um, okay, but as I said in the beginning, uh, I will mostly speak about uh, strongly correlating effects. Uh, and then it's really inappropriate to uh, talk about single particle excitation spectrum, but instead one needs to study the many particle system of the full uh, coupled system. Uh, maybe this is a bit too trivial, but there's one point that I would like to emphasize. Namely, uh, it can turn out that you have multiple uh, Ushiba-Rusino subgap states in the single particle spectrum. And then the question is how many, mar many particle states you can generate out of that. So, for example, you expect to have a state uh, at, uh, at an energy which is the sum of these two. 
uh, basically by putting one quasi-particle uh, in each state. But then one might wonder if these are fermions, why not put two of them with opposite spin in one of these states? Uh, so you would expect another excitation here at twice the energy. Uh, but in fact, by attaching a single quasi-particle to your spin, you already bind them together into a, a strongly attached uh, reduced spin state, right? So it's impossible to put another quasi-particle from the same symmetry channel uh, to reduce the energy further. Yes? So when you think about when you put a system, uh, you, you, you look at spectrum of additional particles, so you look at En plus 1 minus En or something else? Now these are the, th that's the full spectrum of the complete Fox space. But well, fix, uh, well, I mean, we're talking about BCS, so the charge is not well defined, and we But there are still even odd sectors. So sure. Yes. Yes. So, so th the, this the would be even. Space. This would be odd. Odd. This would be even. Um, so there is an alternation between the yeah. even and odd parity. I'm not sure I understand how to get put on the same on the same picture. Uh, which one? I mean, uh, uh, we will see plenty of examples of that. So. The point is that uh, when you tunnel, you change the parity, right? So I would look at the difference. Of ah, okay. Uh, th this is not an. Uh, this is not a single particle excitation. So it's, this is not a spectral function that I'm discussing. Th this is the complete set of states, uh, and obviously tunneling can only happen by changing parity and uh, s by one half. Uh, I will come to that actually in the in, in two slides. Um, Okay, uh, but uh, I will now continue with the quantum case. So actually, if you do the calculation for a full uh, quantum mechanical model, uh, you will again find that at small coupling, uh, you get a quasi-particle continuum. And if you increase the coupling, there will be a subgap state. And phenomenologically, actually, this seems quite similar to the classical case. Um, but there's a number of differences. Uh, most notably, uh, at the quantitative level, the behavior will be quite different. And now, uh, the position of the two states depends on the ratio between the condo temperature and the gap. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, the reason why one really needs the quantum model is that uh, from the results for the quantum model, one sees that if you have a subgap state which is well inside the, uh, well inside the gap, this immediately implies that these two scales are comparable. Right? Uh, so this means that if you're in classical limit, it's hard to see uh, how you would end up in this regime. So the reason uh, why classical model still works uh, probably has to do with magnetic anisotropies. And in fact, I have a picture which tells you what you would find without taking into account any uh, <laughs> anisotropy. So how the, the energy progresses towards the classical limit. And you see that uh, it's basically one over S dependence. So uh, if your spin is 10, fine, so you get a 10% difference. Uh, but if you're really talking magnetical ad atoms with a spin of the order of 2 or so, uh, then it's really questionable whether this model makes sense at the quantitative level. But it's a useful phenomenology, perhaps. Okay, so in the following, uh, what I show will be mostly uh, results of a numerical renormalization group. Uh, so just in a few words, this method consists into discretizing the continuum of states in the model uh, in a logarithmic way so that you get a better description of states around the Fermi level, which contribute more to the uh, uh, condo processes. And then you do a Gram-Schmidt transformation and you will find a, a chain-like Hamiltonian that you just simply then uh, directly diagonalize by adding one site uh, at a time and you do that iteratively. And the reason why this approach works basically is that uh, with this kind of chain, uh, which has uh, decreasing hopping coefficients, it turns out that the matrix elements, uh, as you go away from the diagonal in the Hamiltonian, they rapidly decrease. So actually the color scale, or grayscale here uh, is in fact uh, logarithmic. So these are very tiny matrix elements. So it's perfectly fine to just disregard certain states. So anyhow, uh, now uh, I come back to this point, maybe, uh, which is relevant. Uh, uh, so the question is, how are the many body states, so the full spectrum uh, of states in the system, how is that related to the uh, spectral function? And well, basically, just by definition, when you're at zero temperature, 
your spectral function uh, is basically just tells you what are the all, what are all the possible processes for going from the ground state uh, to your excited states, and this is what we expect that uh, uh, is being measured in this single particle tunnel in climate, right? Is this correct? Right, and then uh, what is expected that if the total many-body ground state of the system is a spin singlet, you expect to see excitations, uh, let's say, to the doublet uh, Shiba state. And this will appear as a pair of peaks. And the same uh, case in the, uh, if you're in the other regime where the ground state is a doublet, uh, and then you have excitations to the spingle, singlet excited state, and again you expect to see two peaks. And this seems very uh, similar in both cases, um, but what is more interesting is that uh, then if you apply a magnetic field, uh, you expect to see splitting of Zeeman states. And then uh, you would, in fact, observe a very clear difference between the two cases. So in one case, uh, where in the singlet, you will observe a splitting, uh, while in the other case, again, in the zero temperature limit, you would uh, expect to see a single pair of states because the other ones are not accessible. But at finite temperatures, yes, there would definitely be replicas. Okay, and it turns out that this kind of uh, simple picture, uh, uh, so call it a local density of state picture, works pretty well, uh, for example, for uh, carbon nanotube quantum dots. And here it turns out that uh, if you just model the measured uh, uh, spectral function after the deconvolution, uh, you actually find excellent agreement uh, if you do comparisons with energy excitation spectra, not only inside the gap, but also outside the gap. So all these features are actually uh, real effects. And this allows you to do many things. Uh, for example, it's probably one of the most accurate ways to extract uh, parameters for your quantum dot. So local energy, uh, charge, and also hybridization. That's more difficult to do in the, uh, when your system is in the normal state. OK, so after this extended introduction, I will come to the main points of my talk. So what I want to show you are two things. One is that uh, if you open a superconducting gap in an interacting strongly correlated system, basically this gives you a window to look directly into the different possible many-body ground state of your total system. So this really allows you to study the competition between various interactions. Uh, and I will illustrate that by showing you a few examples. Then the other point will be that the sub-gap sub states that we see are very differently renormalized. Uh, and, well, again, uh, it's best that I show you examples for that. Okay, so starting uh, with the competing interactions, uh, one thing that is very interesting is to consider high spin uh, quantum impurities, because in the end, uh, local moment arises from spins in various orbitals, and indeed, uh, in many of these impurities, you will find large spin uh, states, uh, but since these spins are coming from different orbitals, actually the impurity will couple to so-called uh, different channels. So these are just different uh, combinations of, uh, of substrate states with different symmetries. And there can be up to two times the impurity spin of this. And then if you try to construct all the possible Shiba multiplets that could conceivably occur inside the gap, uh, you can just do the following exercise. So you start, start with the the total spin uh, in the limit of when all the channels are completely decoupled. And then you can attach one quasi-particle from each of the channels. As I said, only one quasi-particle uh, can be bound in this way. Uh, uh, because of sor sort of each time you exhaust uh, one degree of freedom. But of course, you can attach quasi-particles from different channels. And this would reduce your spin further. And you can continue this until you get to the singlet ground state. And uh, if you're careful how many states that would be in total, so it could be, in principle, up to two to the power of two times the impurity spin. Now, the order of these states, uh, that depends a lot on the exchange couplings, J1, J2, and so forth. And uh, one of the questions, for example, uh, is uh, at what condo temperature or what, what coupling strengths you get uh, transition from high spin to low spin uh, ground states. And we did a number of calculations. So back then for up to two channels, now one can go a bit further. Uh, but basically the picture that emerges from that is that um, the, this ratio is not universal, but depends on the number of uh, channels or and more importantly on the spin of the impurity. 
So we see that uh, roughly these numbers along uh, each column are pretty close, right? uh, but they depend strongly on spin. And uh, obviously, so this is for JC, uh, which are the same. Uh, but then, uh, of course, uh, you can also have cases where J's are different. Uh, just taking the simplest example of spin one, two channels, uh, you see that, uh, again, you find the transition, which I so this is the number, sorry, here, uh, where you go from high spin to lowest spin. Uh, but basically, when J's are different, you also have intermediate doublet states. And these states, obviously, are competing. So one nice example, which is a bit academic, but very interesting, I think, uh, uh, is, is when you take a two-channel spin one-half model, uh, which has non-fermi liquid physics. And here you find that uh, there are only two possibilities. So either your spin is unscreened, uh, so a doublet, or you can have an extended singlet phase. And if you look a bit closer into this problem, you would find that it's very anomalous in many properties. For example, uh, the transition point uh, is way away from where you would expect it to be. So this is quite, so it's different from the single channel case by a factor of five. Uh, more interestingly is when you look at the many body state spectrum of the system, you'll find that the ground state, so for small j, uh, would be a doublet. And then there are two possible uh, Shiba states, which are both singlet. And uh, if you make j1 <laughs> equal to j2, they will be degenerate. So when you increase J, what you expect is to have a doubly degenerate singlet ground state of the system. And this is precisely what happens. So this is the picture, of, uh, the uh, calculation results. So you start with a doublet, then you have a doubly degenerate singlet, singlet, which at some point become the new ground state of the system. And you can picture that as uh, either the formation of condo singlet with one or the other channel. Uh, whereas the excited state in this case is just the decoupled uh, doublet. And finally, you see that there's another state uh, which arises here, and uh, which only appears in the large J limit. And basically what happens here is that uh, now you have sort of uh, higher order coupling between the two continua through this uh, doublet state. Uh, so it's a sort of uh, over screening, but that, that's not the ground state in this system. It's an uh, excited state. Okay. This is spin one half, spin one half. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's over screened. But it's excited state, not the ground state. This is interesting, actually. Yes? Yes. Uh, this one. Okay, so along this line you have double degeneracy, but uh, in other cases you have just a single singlet state. Yes. 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 Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, it's always a sing the singlet is always the ground state. Uh, actually, I have a plot. So, uh, okay, this is the same J case. And this is when you break the symmetry. So this is what happens. So now you see that uh, the ground state will be the one with the larger J, whereas the other singlet basically just goes to the continuum very rapidly. This is what happens. And you see that this difference in J is very small. So this is very sensitive. The same as the two-channel condo effect in the normal uh, state case. Um, yes? No, it's a doublet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, let me continue. So now with this uh, multi-channel, multi-high spin case, what we need to include in addition uh, to be able to model real system is magnetic anisotropy. So uh, we heard about it uh, uh, before. So um, what we expect to happen is that all the multiplets which have S larger or equal to one uh, will be split. Right? And uh, the splitting will be some renormalized value from um, bare anisotropy. And this renormalization can be quite large. I, I will not show any plots for that, but I will discuss this in the case of uh, Zeeman splitting. And there you will see that renormalization effects are very strong. OK, so then, uh, of course, you have now competition between Kondo, magnetic anisotropy. So it gets or very complicated. Uh, and um, these different crowd states also have uh, 
clear experimental signatures, uh, which would uh, come out as various splittings uh, that Katerina is uh, able to see. Uh, the, the, this is, well, it depends on what is your ground state. For example, uh, this plot here, uh, here you're in the doublet. So this would, yeah, this would be under screening basically because you have a doublet ground state. Uh, this region here. Okay, and uh, yeah, this is perhaps more relevant uh, when you have two channels. Uh, this is just the spectrum. So th this at first would be difficult to interpret. Uh, this is just one example. Uh, here, for example, it turns out that you have ground state spin one half uh, and you have coupling to two channels and this turns out to be a triplet and this is a singlet. And this is actually similar to uh, the case that Katerina was discussing. So how this arises, for example, so when J's are zero, uh, you have a, this is a triplet uh, ground state. Then you crank up J1, uh, you get one subgate state, you turn on J2, you have two of them. Then you continue increasing the values, so you also have the singlet state, and at some point these two cross, and finally when you take into account also um, splitting, uh, so magnetic anisotropy, this would generate some splitting. Uh, this one is not spectroscopically visible, but this one is, and if you compare this picture, so expect to see two states here, and one state, uh, one peak here, and this is precisely what is found in the spectral function calculations. Okay, um, and finally, one last example of this kind of competitions is the two impurity condo, which has also been discussed. So now we have a competition between the formation of a local singlet and two separately screened uh, uh, impurities. And these are two different singlet states, right? Now, uh, uh, <coughs> when you open a superconducting gap, you expect these to be two different many body uh, singlets and you expect that at some point they should cross. And this is precisely what happens. So at small j, you see uh, your ground state is a condo singlet, which is also signaled by the fact that if you compute the um, uh, S1, S2 scalar product, it's pretty much close, it's almost zero. And then you have at some point a transition to the interimpurity singlet, uh, which has very large negative S1, S2. Uh, which is really a good sign that uh, what you see is uh, an interimpurity singlet. And these things are spectroscopically visible because uh, one would see this transition, for example, and also at finite temperature, uh, you would see doubling uh, because also this excited state would be thermally populated. So in principle, these are measurable effects. Okay, uh, so these were examples of competition between ground state, and now I'm coming to the second point, which is the unequal renormalization of various uh, system parameters. And uh, a nice example where this can be seen is when you have coupling to the phonons, so some local vibrational mode. Uh, this could be, for example, a molecule uh, with sufficiently small uh, uh, frequency. And uh, then if you consider this kind of uh, uh, system where you have linear coupling, uh, if you do some calculation, what you expect basically is that uh, for all fermionic spectral features, there should be some side peaks. And the uh, distance between these side peaks is some frequency which could be strongly renormalized from the bare one. And also there's a question of how much this state would shift due to the electron phonon coupling. And then if you do this kind of calculation for a simple model, so it, this is an uh, Anderson impurity, which has the hybridization uh, modulated by the, uh, by the phonon, uh, then what you, one would in principle expect, expect is that all the many body states should have some kind of phononic side peaks uh, or side states. And then you have transitions between, let's say, the ground state doublet and uh, excited singlet states. And you can trace this out, and there are two things which are interesting here. One thing is that by increasing J, you actually can induce a singlet doublet transition, which means that the two states have very different polaronic shifts, right? That's one thing. The other thing that you can follow is how the effective frequency is renormalized. And again, uh, one could naively expect that this should be the same in both states, because this is sort of ground state property, but that's precisely the point. So. These are really different states which are competing to be the ground state. And in each of those, uh, the renormalization processes will be different. And uh, so in this case, we have actually a potential which is, uh, um, is not, is a harmonic. 
so Morse potential. And it turns out that uh, for harmonic potentials, typically what you expect uh, is that the phononic modes will soften, whereas uh, a harmonicity typically leads to hardening. And here we have a case that actually this both happens, but in different levels. So this is a very peculiar situation here. And again, these kind of things are potentially measurable, provided that one finds uh, a molecule which is floppy enough to have low energy uh, excitations. And hopefully, if these are strongly renormalized, they would become uh, smaller than the gap. And OK, and one last example, uh, which is also very relevant, is how these states split as a function of the magnetic field. Because these, are, these states have finite spin, and then if you apply magnetic field, uh, basically what you expect is some uh, Zeeman splitting. Now, how much they split obviously will depend on how much the impurity is coupled to the continuum uh, because of the renormalization. <coughs> OK, so this is just one. So the splitting have been already observed. But what I want to emphasize now is that the, if you have a generic impurity with, with large spin and several subgap Shiba states uh, with different spin, um, what you expect is that these G factors will not be the same. They're different. Uh, even more interestingly, it turns out that uh, they can even be larger than one. And this is an interesting thing to understand. Uh, so for here I just plot how the G factor evolves as a function of the quantum exchange coupling. And you see that actually for the doublet excited state, uh, it even starts at a value which is larger than one. And the way to understand that is actually that your spin one impurity uh, makes a strongly bound uh, it's a composite state with a quasi-particle from the continuum. So this generates a spin one half. But then when you consider how strongly this state is perturbed by a local field applied only on the impurity side, uh, basically you need to do some projections. And what comes out is precisely this ratio of 4 to 3. And you, you can repeat the calculation for higher spins, and this works very well. Now the funny thing here is that you obtain this number in the small j limit. Basically, when you have very little condo coupling uh, uh, or well, uh, exchange coupling between your impurity and the quasi-particles, which means that basically even for small j, all these subgap Shiba states should really be thought of as strongly coupled composite magnetic entities, right? And, and th I think this is a very funny observation. I, I would not expect that. Okay, and uh, with this, I will conclude. So we see that uh, there's a significant complexity of the subgap spectra in these systems, uh, which can be computed quite accurately nowadays. That's one point. And from the other side, now it's possible to do very accurate measurements, especially when you go to very low temperatures. You really expect to start to see tiny splittings and uh, additional states. And uh, since those can, the, their positions can be extracted in very accurate fashion, this will provide very stringent tests for the theory. Okay, thank you. <laughs>